Good morning. We're glad to be with you again this Sunday morning. It's a beautiful day, hot day, been some hot, hot weather. Hope you're staying cool, enjoying. If you're watching this, it means you're not able to get out yet but to join with us. We want you to know that we miss you and we can't wait to see you again. Or you're not from Columbus and you're, and you're watching in, we're glad to have you with us. We are in the Gospel of John and we have just finished the final discourse. Jesus has been with his disciples in the upper room uh, from chapter 13 through chapter 17 of the Gospel of John. We have seen Jesus meet with his disciples uh, to serve them, to wash their feet, to teach them, to equip them, to speak into their lives, to love them. And then ultimately in the last chapter 17 to, to pray to his father, to pray for them, specifically the 11 disciples who are left. Judas has left the upper room to go betray Jesus. And then Jesus prays for everyone who will receive Jesus Christ. As a result of their ministry, these 11, and the power of their word is going to continue until one day we're with the Lord. And so he has spent this time praying with the disciples, and now we shift into chapter 18. So our prayer this morning as we meet uh, with the word of God, Lord, with you, that you would speak into our hearts. Uh, may your spirit lead us and direct us and guide us. Touch our hearts with your word by your spirit as only you can. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So where we are in John 18, and Jesus is in Jerusalem, it's Passover, it is Thursday evening, uh, the next day tomorrow he's going to be crucified. Everything is being set in motion now. So he's, he's in the upper room, he has been in the upper room here in the red, and he leaves. There's a couple of different locations here in Jerusalem that they think might have been the location of the upper room, we don't know with certainty, but he leaves. And he leaves the upper room and he crosses the, the Kidron Valley or the Kidron uh, River right here. And he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane is located on the Mount of Olives. Significant in scripture, significant to what will happen in prophecy, to what will happen in fulfillment of God's promises to Israel, to us, to the church. So Jesus now leaves and he crosses the Kidron Valley. This little river that flows down, that flows down through comes right behind the temple. And so that river would have, would have had the, the, the junk that comes from the temples. They uh, carried out their sacrifices every day, just the blood and the water and the goop. And, and as he walked across that river each time, it would just, and now especially, it just would have reminded him of the sacrifices that were being given here at Passover. And ultimately is just a picture of what's about to take place, that he would be the ultimate sacrificial lamb that he would give himself up for us in our place, in the place of his people, Israel, and lay down his life. And so he crosses that valley and he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's interesting here as we come to, to, uh, uh, to John, God, John doesn't speak about what happens in the Garden of Gethsemane. The other synoptic gospels, gospels do, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they speak with some detail as to what takes place, and, and we know those elements. John, John has a different purpose as he's writing. His focus here is, is on the glory of God as to everything that's happening ultimately is bringing honor and glory to Christ and to his Father. And so John gives that portrayal. The reason he unfolds what he does is he portrays Jesus Christ ultimately as the Son of God, the Savior, that we might have faith in him. And he lifts and exalts up Jesus Christ. Now the glimpse that we might pull from the other Gospels about, about this time together that they have in the Garden of Gethsemane that John doesn't doesn't give us because of what he's trying to accomplish. Matthew 28 reminds us that they're there and he sell, tells the disciples, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Then he says this, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I want to focus on that today, just the willingness of our, of our Savior, the willingness that he uh, exhibits to us, a willing spirit. Uh, to do what his father has called him to do, to do what has been planned from eternity past. And so, and so Jesus Christ is going to model that to us as believers and to his disciples, and, and he's going to exhibit that commitment to that task to the very end. And so the scene that we see as they come out of the garden is the scene here in these first verses in chapter 18 where Jesus is arrested. And so we pick it up in verse 1 and 2, and so... When Jesus had spoken these words, that is, in the upper room, they leave. And he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden. See, John doesn't mention the garden. He doesn't name the garden. It's the Garden of Gethsemane, which he and his disciples entered. And verse 2 tells us, for Jesus often had met there with his disciples. And so, and so they go to this garden location, and, 
And we see other uh, passages in, in the Gospels where the disciples and Jesus would go there. And it's play, maybe a place where Jesus would often stay when he would come to Jerusalem. And so they go there. It's a place that has been a place of, uh, of just of getting away, of, of communing together, of being together, a special place. Maybe someone that they knew owned this. And, uh, and so they go and they go here to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus is arrested. And so what we're highlighting today, what we're looking at today for our benefit is simply the willing spirit of our Savior to do the, the Lord's, the, the, His Father's will. And that's our focus. And so how do we see that here in this passage? Well, in this first verse, we simply see this. We see the willingness of our Savior to, to keep moving forward, to stay the course. You know, as He's leaving the upper room, uh, he's, been, he's been in this uh, point of tension now for quite a while that the Jewish leaders want to, to kill him, to grab him, to execute him, to remove him as a threat from Israel. He's a political threat to them. He is, he is setting himself up to be king, a messiah. They don't believe he's the promised messiah. They see him as a threat to be king. They see him as a threat to, to their comfortable position under Rome, which is, a, which is they are an occupied people. Nothing comfortable about that. But they've gotten used to that. They've gotten used to the power they've accumulated to themselves under Rome to function and to rule the, is the people of Israel, the Hebrews. And so we see here Jesus, uh, he doesn't shy back. He doesn't hesitate. He moves forward. And um, he has confidence. He has purpose. He leaves that upper room. He goes into the Kidron Valley. He leaves that garden and he, and he moves forward. And, and we see this here. And then we see uh, the next step when we pick it up in verse 2 and 3. And so, now Judas, who had betrayed him, also knew the place. And so Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. And so we see Jesus, a willingness to face the danger that he knew was right there. He, he sees the danger. He's aware of the danger. He steps into the danger. He moves forward. He doesn't hesitate. There's a confidence in his, in, in his demeanor, his heart, his character, in his heart. And he moves forward. He knows what's about to take place. And so he's going to encounter Judas here. Chapter 2, Judas who had already betrayed him. He knows the place. Judas had been here often with Jesus with the disciples, uh, communing, resting, fellowshipping, praying, talking, engaging, planning, whatever might have taken place in the garden here. Judas knew the place. He knew all that took place. And so he comes and he says here in verse 2, um, the other gospels tell us this, there was a mob of people that came. It was a great a group of people that came. John is the only one who tells us not only all these people, Jewish and the Jewish leaders, John is the only one who tells us that Rome is involved as well. And so Judas brings with him soldiers from Rome. It says here in verse 3, he procured a band of soldiers. The word band is the word cohort. The word cohort, and you know all this, it, it, signifies, it signifies a group uh, of, of soldiers up to 600 soldiers. You know, remember, there's a whole lot going on. It's Passover. All of Israel is coming in together. This whole thing about Jesus has now hit a, hit a, a white-hot level of, of uh, energy. Everyone knows the ministry of Jesus. Everyone knows he's, he, what he has said, what he's claimed, what he's proclaimed. They know that the Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they hate him. They are saying he's claiming to be king. He wants to take over. Rome knows this, and so they see this, they see this real threat. And so the Jewish leaders have come to him. Judas has come, and we need to apprehend this threat to Rome. And so they see Jesus as a political threat, and it's not at all unlikely that they brought a huge contingent of soldiers with them because there's a potential for, from their eyes for a, a political uprising for Jesus. They know they, they probably are aware of the stories that swirl around him, the, the, maybe the miracles, uh, the things that have been attributed to him. And so there's, a, there's an angst. Um, that everyone in Jerusalem is feeling. So it's not at all unlikely that maybe they brought even a full contingent. But they bring the soldiers out. Judas comes out. The, the religious leaders of the Sanhedrin, they all come out. They're coming with uh, torches and lanterns and uh, with weapons. And uh, they're coming out uh, to get Jesus. In spite of that danger, he's willing to move forward. In fact, he does move forward. Uh, he doesn't hide. And... Um, 
And so as we move forward, we pick it up in verses 4 through 11. So then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to him, Who do you seek? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and they fell to the ground. And so he asked them, Who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. And so if you seek me, let these men go. And this was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I lost not one. And then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck off the high priest's servants, cut off his right ear. And the servant's name was Malchus. And so Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. And so this, this next passage, this next length of verses, gives us a, a, a powerful a picture here that's very descriptive. Jesus displays to us, he exhibits a, a, a willing spirit. Remember, everything that Jesus Christ does in his life, he empowers us to do as well. He exhibits a willing spirit. That willingness is based upon power in his life. So let's look at those, let's look at those elements here. So in verse 4 we see this. Jesus knew all that would happen to him. Jesus, Jesus comes with power. He's willing because he has the power to know. He, what he portrays here is omniscience. What he portrays here is the very quality of deity. He knows everything that's about to happen. Every detail, every minute element of what's about to take place this evening, tomorrow morning, as he goes to the cross, he knows it all. He is intimately aware of what's going to take place. And he moves forward anyways. What power? He exhibits, he exhibits power in the face of knowledge that he has as the very Son of God. And he moves forward. <clears throat> he knows what Judas is up to. He, noticed, he knows what Judas has already done. He, noted, he knows that the soldiers are coming in strength. He knows all of that. He knows their intent. He knows what they're about to do. There is power that he displays here. What I want you to notice here is who's in control as we walk through this narrative. Because the next step is this. He has the power to absolutely control. Look, look at this. Um, verse 4. He, he approaches them. He comes forward. He initiates the action. He takes control in verse 4. He moves forward and he says, who do you seek? He confronts them. The whole crowd the Jews, the mob who's with them, the soldiers who are with them. He confronts them first. Who, who do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. He's always been identified, not Jesus of Bethlehem, Jesus of Nazareth. That's been the common, that's been the common perception of the people, even though the Jews who are looking for Messiah know and understand that the Messiah would come from Bethlehem. Those who have come to him in faith understand and know his birth in Bethlehem. But the common perception is he's of Nazareth. For he had fled Bethlehem and came back and lived in Nazareth. And so he's Jesus of Nazareth. And they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he said to them, I am he. And Judas is standing there. He's watching this. And when Jesus said to him, them, I am he, they drew back and they fell to the ground. This is the only place in the Gospels that we see this. And we see Jesus. He's in absolute control. He has power to control. So they say, who are you looking for? And Jesus says, I am. He is not in there. The word he is not there. It's supplied to give us understanding. The word is ego in the Greek, ego a me, I am. It is, it is the expression of the, the very deity of the Father in the Old Testament, I am that I am, the name of, of Lord, the Lord Jehovah. It is that same expression, it is that same expression of deity. And Jesus, for a moment, Jesus here in just a moment, some say, well, no, they just tripped and they fell back. It doesn't fit the narrative. It doesn't, it doesn't fit what's unfolding in the narrative there's there's a there is uh real clarity that when jesus says i am there is in some way shape or form there's a burst there's a burst of deity and power that comes forth from christ and overwhelms even the soldiers remember this is rome they are the conquerors of the then known world they are tough they are violent they are disciplined they don't retreat to no one they don't surrender to no one they are in control they are always in control and in this moment jesus says i am 
and, and the expression of that deity, and whether whether it may be in a in a flash in a moment there was a, there was a simple release of 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 the glory of God, like on the Mount of Transfiguration, it doesn't say that took place here, but maybe there's some just glimpse of the deity of Christ. We don't know that. We can't we can't know that for sure. It doesn't say that. But what we do know is that there is power revealed in some way, simply maybe even with the spoken words, there's power revealed and it drives them to their feet. It drives them to the ground. Judas included. They are all driven to the they fall back, they, they fall back and down. And um and we see the very power of God through Christ in this moment. He's in charge. He's in control. That's important to see. Matthew 26 is a reminder to us. Jesus says this as he's in the garden. He says, do you think that I can't appeal to my Father right now? And he will at once send me 12 legions of angels. But how are the scriptures going to be fulfilled? How is the scriptures going to be fulfilled in this moment if I do that? I have a task. I have a purpose. I have a mission. I'm called to save, to seek and to save those who are lost. I'm called to be the sacrificial lamb. If I call those angels and the Father supplies those angels at the end of story, the Scriptures fall apart. All fulfillment of Scripture must take place and happen. And I, am, I, and I, am ex, and I exhibit a willing spirit to the mission of my Father. And so Jesus displays power, and then, and then we continue... How else do we see the power of Christ here in, in these verses? Well, it says in verse 7, and so, and so again, like they get back up off the ground. I don't know what they're feeling. They're stunned. They're in awe. They're whatever. They get back up off the ground, and, and Jesus says again, so who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And so Jesus says, I told you that I am he. And so if you seek me, let these go. And this was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. And so what he exhibits here is power. The power, the power to, you know, as he's, as he's giving his life, as he's about to face excruciating um, persecution and, and mocking and, and um, being beaten and nails driven in his hands and feet and a crown thrust upon his head and he's about to, to experience all of this, what does he display here? He loves the disciples. He protects them. Uh, he delivers them, and he directs the men. If you seek me, let these men go. Now remember, this is Rome. Nobody, folks, nobody orders Rome around. Rome has come with a mission. Already the soldiers have been driven back to their feet. And they get back on their feet, and that display of power is for a purpose and for a reason. It has showed the Roman soldiers and the Sanhedrin leaders who were there, and Judas who was there, who's in control. And Jesus says, let these men go. Nobody tells Rome to do that. But he tells the soldiers, if you want me, you let these men go. What love he has for his disciples. We really see his heart here. And then we see in, in verse 10, Simon, 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 Simon reacts. Simon always reacts. He pulls out the sword and he swings. He takes a wild swing. Verse, verse 10, And he drew it and he, and he struck the high priest's servant, his slave. And he cut off his right ear and the servant's name was Malchus. This is the only gospel in which the name of the servant is given. And he, and he just takes out that sword and... Whoosh, you know, I think, he, I, think he, I think he had every intention of killing that man. You don't intend to take off an ear... No one's that good. He's not a swordsman. He's a fisherman, right? And he, and he swings wildly and he takes off the ear. And you can imagine the chaos that takes place in that moment. And the soldiers pulling out their weapons and everybody, and everybody on guard and there's the tenseness and, and uh, the weapons come out and the disciples fanned in a circle and who knows what. And Judas is sitting there watching all this. And uh, we see Jesus still in control. He says to Peter, put your sword away. Put your short sword away. Put it back in its sheath. We're told in Luke chapter 22, Jesus said to them, no more of this. And he touched the ear, he touched the ear of the servant. He touches the ear of the servant and he heals him. He touches the servant's ear and he heals him. And he diffuses the situation. What power? Jesus is in control the whole time. They think they're in control. And they have been shown right here in so many ways that they're not in control. 
They're dealing with a, they're dealing with a, 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 an enemy from their perspective they can't control. They're dealing from an adversary they can't control. And he's displaying that here. Now the Gospels give us different details of this evening and what takes place here. We're not going to go into all those, but let me just kind of show you a picture here, okay? So what's a potential flow of what happens? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Let me just kind of walk that through. This isn't ironclad. It might, it might adjust a little bit. It's my thoughts as to what this might look like tonight. So they're in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus spends time there. He's in agony as he prays. And, uh, and he says, he rises and he says, my betrayer is at hand to the disciples. And he, and he goes out and he moves forward. And, and he says to them, who do you seek? And, and the Gospels tell us that uh, Judas right away comes forward. And he says to Judas, would you betray? Would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Would you betray me with a kiss? The answer is yes. So Judas greets him, and Judas kisses him. That's the sign that this is the man that they're looking for. It's dark. They can't see that well. They don't know exactly who maybe this is. Maybe some of them don't. The leaders do. The St. Peter does. Judas steps forward right away, and he betrays Jesus Christ, and he greets him as a friend, and he kisses him. And they had asked him, who do you seek? And then, and then, Jude, and then Jesus probably answers that question, and he drives the soldiers to their knees. And he drives them down. And he displays his power. And then, and then the Gospels, Matthew tells us, he says to Judas, friend, do what you can to do. Because you see in Matthew 26, 49, Judas greets him, gives him a kiss, that's first. And then probably he says, I am that I am. And they, re, and they fall. And then, and then he says back to Judas, friend, do what you came to do. And then here's where they seize him. And Judas brings out the sword right? And then Jesus says to Judas, stop, put the sword away. I could call a legions of angels, but I'm here to fulfill a purpose. Ultimately, the God's word will be fulfilled. That's kind of a picture. And we see ultimately here in verses 11 and 12, the willingness of Christ to accept the, the cost. Jesus says, shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? And the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and they bound him. Paul reminds us that uh, it was for us, it was for all of us, that Jesus, who, who knew no sin, wasn't tainted by sin, wasn't touched by sin, never experienced sin, became sin for us. That we might become right with God. We might have an opportunity to be right with God. We might be made righteous with God through faith in Christ. Psalm 75 reminds us, In the hand of the Lord there is the cup of foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours it out, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. They're going to drain it down to the last drop. God's wrath is going to be poured out on all unbelief. His wrath is going to be poured out on all unbelievers. Revelation 14.10 shows us this picture. And, and the unbeliever, he will drink the wine of God's wrath, and it's going to be poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And and he, the unbeliever, will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of his holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And, and here we see the, the terrible wrath of God that's going to be poured out on mankind. It is that wrath that's poured out here on Jesus Christ. That's the cup that Jesus Christ willingly receives. He takes the wrath that is, that is designed for, for unbelievers, ultimately for Satan and his angels, and it is given to man in unbelief. And that wrath is to be poured out on him but the, there is a cover that is made for all mankind at the cross. And Jesus takes the full wrath of God. And he, and he is judged as a sinner. He stands in our place. And now, for anyone who come to him, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he stands as our protection from the Father. And his love and his grace and his sacrifice on our behalf stands. And it, it extends to us cover. It extends to us relationship in Him so that we can know the Father. And the wrath of God, we are now protected from that wrath for all eternity. All of us who have a relationship, if you have a relationship with Christ this morning, you are standard in protection. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, and He withdrew from them, and He knelt down, and He prayed, and He says, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup, this wrath from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. 
So what do we do? How do we exhibit this in our life? How do we, how do we live like Christ? How do we exhibit a willing spirit? Let me just give you a few thoughts. One is we just we keep moving forward in our life as he did. He moved forward. Paul says, I want to know him. I want to know him. I gotta strain forward. I gotta I gotta move forward. I want to press on. There's a goal here is to be like Christ. It's, it's the call of Christ in my life. I've got to keep moving forward in my life. And so I've got to forget what lies behind. I gotta forget, I gotta I gotta let go of the scars, I gotta let go of the hurts, I gotta let go of the people who have harmed me, I gotta let go of my sins in the past, I gotta let go of those things, and I gotta and I look ahead at the victory in Christ, and I look ahead at the transformation of Christ, and I gotta let go of the of the I gotta let go of the of the victories and I gotta let go of the of the things God has done because those are yesterday and God will honor me tomorrow for those things. But I've got to live for today and for tomorrow. Those victories aren't my victories in the future. I've got to live so that I'm victorious tomorrow. I can never live because I have been successful in the past and just take that for granted. I've got to build new victories every day. I've got to stand true to the Lord every day. I've got to let the Lord change me today like he changed me yesterday. I've got to submit and yield every day. I've got to keep moving forward. Peter reminds me, if we're going to exhibit this ruling spirit, we need to be vigilant. Uh, our adversary, he's a devil. He prowls. He's trying to devour us. Everything that's under his control in this world is instruments in his hand. The world are, is an instrument in his hand. The culture is an instrument in his hand. Our flesh, our sinful flesh, is an instrument in his hand. And he uses all of those things to devour us. He wants to take a bite out of you, and it hurts. Maybe this week there's been bites taken out of your vitality in Christ. Maybe there have been choices and decisions and things you wish you could take back. There's an adversary who's, who's wanting to take advantage of all those things and use those things to destroy you, to hurt you. And Jesus reminds us we're to be, we're to be clear-minded, we're to be sober-minded, we're to be vigilant, we're to be watchful. We're to resist the one by being strong in faith. And we're to understand that, that our brothers and sisters around the world or having to stand tall just like you and I in Christ. And that we're not alone. You're never alone. You are never alone. Find a body of Christ and connect to that body of Christ. Connect, connect to your youth group. Connect to the church. Connect to brothers and sisters in Christ. It is important that you connect. We're never to be isolated together. That is, the, that is a, a guarantee of failure in our life. We must draw strength from one another and the wisdom of God together. We need to stand in His power uh, we need to trust Him completely. First, Second Thessalonians, the Lord is faithful. He will establish you. He will guard you against the evil one. He is the one who guards. He is the one who strengthens. The Lord is my strength. He is my shield. In Him I trust. My heart trusts. And I am helped. And my heart exalts. And with my song I give thanks to Him. When the Lord is helping you, when the Lord is helping me, my heart is, is filled with worship. You know, when you come to church and you worship, when it's exciting in your heart, when it's genuine, when it's authentic, it reflects this, that you have let God help you that week. You know, I, I, see, I see often people come and there's just a joy in their life because they are walking with God. God is helping them every day. They are yielding to God's power and help every day. And I also see those who come to the church there's no joy in their worship and they're disconnected from worship and, and their eyes are wandering and their heart is wandering because they've not sought the help of the Lord that week and they've, they've ran, they've done everything that week in their own power, their own strength. There's no reason to lift up God and worship when I've not been with Him all week. God calls you and He calls me. Lord, help me. Lord, be my strength. And Lord, draw my heart to you and worship because of your resources in my life. He calls us not only to stand in His power, but to act on His power. Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God. The whole armor of God. You know, that armor is truth. It's being, it's being true to God, and true to ourselves. It is, it is righteousness. It's being right with others. It's being right with God. Have I been that this week? Have I put on that armor of God and said, Lord, I, I, I desire to be right with you today. I'm going to be true to you today. I'm going to be ready with the gospel. The gospel is good news Lord, I'm going to look at my relationship to you and everything in that relationship I'm going to view as good news. I'm going to look at prayer as good news in my life. I'm going to look at your word as good news in my life. I'm going to look at the opportunity to be aware of the presence of God in my life as good news. The gospel is transformative. It is good news in my life every day. Believer, we need to look 
at Christ through that lens every day. Lord, you are good news today in my life. And because of that, I'm going to listen to you and follow you. I'm going to act on that. I've got to put on the armor of God. I'm going, to, I'm going to live in faith. I'm going to say, Lord, I trust you. I trust you enough to obey. I'm going to do what you've asked me to do. That's the armor of God. I'm going to stand in salvation. Lord, because you saved me, that's going to be the motivation for everything I do, the certainty in my heart for what lies ahead. The Word of God is going to be my foundation. From the Word of God, I will gain power and resources and confidence for the day, wisdom for the day. In fact, Proverbs tells us we're to call out for insight and we're to raise our voice for understanding. And, and, and when we do that, when we run to His Word and run to Him and say, Lord, help me, give me wisdom, give me understanding, give me the ability to navigate today so that I'm honoring to you and I please you with all that I do. It says here, for you... He stores up wisdom, and He stores it up for you to be accessible to you in the exact moment you need it. And He's a shield to you who walk in integrity. And He gives discretion to you, and He watches over you, and, he, and with understanding He guards you. If you are pursuing Him, He will release these resources into your life. And so by His grace, we are victorious. It is all about Him. And then we yield ultimately in His power. I delight to do your will. Your law is within my heart. I, I love to do God's will because I am, I am in relationship. The, the Word of God is being poured into my life because first I am in relationship with Him. When I am in relationship with Him, I love His Word. And I let it be poured into my life and let it transform me and change me. Matthew 6.10, our prayer, Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, God, I pray today Your will be done in my life. What you desire in heaven to take place, you desire that also on earth to take place. May it take place today in my life as I navigate in my family and in the schedule of my day and in the priorities of my day. God, may your will be accomplished. Matthew 26, 41. We're reminded here as Jesus is in the garden, he says, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, insanity, insanity, the definition of insanity is what? It's doing the same things over and over and over and over and over and over and over again and expecting the same results. And if I never come to God's Word and I never talk to Him and can prayer, prayer is, prayer, is, prayer is communion. Prayer is uniting my heart. Prayer is enjoying God. Uh, prayer is receiving strength from the Lord. Prayer is drawing the the wisdom and the, and the understanding and the resources of God's Word into my life. Prayer is listening to the Spirit of God and letting Him energize my life in Christ, transform my heart and my will so that, so that I will yield to Him. We need prayer. Jesus was victorious that evening, yes, because He was God. But as full man, He was victorious because He prayed. And He communed with His Father, and He submitted and yielded His will to His Father. And you and I can be victorious in the same way, no matter what we're facing, no matter what dangers we face, no matter what the cost is in our life. If we come to Him in prayer, we will have the victory in Christ. He will pour out His love and resources into our life, enablement into our life and yours. He will give grace to you. He's promised to do that. We've got to continue to stand upon Him. We have to change up what we're doing in our life. We have to yield to God. We can't do it our way anymore and expect and expect good things to happen. We've got to yield to the Lord, to His Word. Prayer is simply letting God touch my heart. I pray this morning that you will let God touch your heart. Things need to change in our lives for God to really work, for His grace to be displayed through our life. For people to see that you and I are, are willing to yield to God and to reflect Christ in my life. For people to see the power of God transform my life, it will happen when I yield to God. It is so personal. The Lord wants you to yield to Him. He is required that I yield to Him personally. That is, that is His call to you and I. Pray that we would follow like Christ. When it seems impossible, understand that Jesus Christ faced the impossible, and it became possible. Whatever seems impossible in your life, through submission to Christ, it is possible. Doing the will of God is not only possible, it is the outcome that is guaranteed when we yield to Christ. May He encourage your heart this morning and ours. He died for you and I. 
he submitted his will in power. He was in full control. The greatest power in this passage is not the things he did before the troops and before the disciples. The greatest power in this passage is the Jesus who was in control and could call those angels on a moment's notice. The greatest power is this. He yielded. Will you yield to the Savior? Will you yield to his plan for you? Will you yield in obedience to him? Will you open his word and yield to him in obedience? Will you yield your heart by talking to him, maybe for the first time in a long time in prayer and communing with him and confessing sin and repenting and turning to him and finding grace and power? Will you yield to him? Father, our prayer this morning is that the Spirit will touch our hearts with this example from Christ that we can't even put into words. What a poor attempt we make to try to, to convey what we see Christ do here. It's just our desire to just touch what Jesus is doing, to understand that because he did this, we can also live in victory like he did. We can face these very same things in our life, not going to a cross and dying physically, but taking up our cross and denying ourselves and living for Christ. The cost is always worth it because the rewards are, are far richer than the cost. Lord, I pray that we would keep our eyes on you, find great encouragement in our walk and relationship with you, the encouragement to be bold and confident in Christ, to stay the course, to honor you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May this word touch your heart. I invite you to join us next week. What a, what a great passage to continue to follow as we look at the example of the love of Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us today on this Sunday.